In the 7th century, Islam emerged out of a revelation of God that was made directly to the Prophet Muhammad over a period of 22 years. This was passed on orally by his companions to form the Quran that contains the account of this revelation. For the believers of Islam, this sacred book is therefore the actual word of God and their entire religion is founded on this text that came down from heaven. For Muslims, God exists. He is a unique God, the creator who gave life to all creatures. The Quran is the divine word, the revelation. It is also the book that is used by Muslims for their prayers. It contains the collection and summary of the main precepts to which Muslims must adhere. The one who was sent by God, Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, taught us as Muslims to respect the prophets. And the Quran taught us by giving us the best possible example to respect Mary, the daughter of Imran, because she is the noble one, the virgin, the pure one, the one who is irreproachable in the eyes of Islam. On the contrary, she was a woman who dedicated herself to God Almighty in adoration, fasting, faith and prayer. This is how Mary is perceived, and we think of her as one of the best women throughout history. I do not pray to Mary, I pray to God. Because for us, we only address our prayers to God. We pray to no one else but God. But when I read the Quran, I read the Surah of Imran and that of Mary. This is how I get a sense of who she is and her spirituality, and I sense her love for God. This is what drives me to love God more and to obey Him, as well as loving Jesus more and getting closer to God because what I want is to get closer to God. Today, Net for God would like to explore the Muslim perception of Mary. What does the Quran say about her? Can she help us walk together with those from different religions on a path of peace? Muhammad Obeid lives in Nazareth in the Holy Land. He's married, father of four children, and works as a judge for the Islamic Court of Nazareth. No Muslim can ignore the presence of the Surah of Mary in the Quran. The Almighty God devoted a blessed and very beautiful Surah to her. And Almighty God tells the story of Mary, how she bore Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of Mary, her serenity and her faith, and how God takes care of her at that time. She is the only woman in the Quran to be called by her first name. This is how the story and virtues of Mary are depicted in detail in two surah of the Quran. The 19th that bears her name, Surah Maryam, and the third. There are other passages in the Quran that mention her briefly. The father of Mary in the Quran 
is called Imran. And the wife of Imran, called Anne, is elderly and barren when she makes a vow to consecrate to God the child that she asks him to grant her miraculously. Consequently, she gives birth to a child, but it is a girl. She is troubled and disappointed by this because she can't understand how a girl can serve in the temple. So Imran's wife calls the child Mary and puts her, as well as her descendants, under the protection of God and against the devil, the banished one. All of the commentators, without exception in this instance, mention a hadith, that is, a word attributed to Muhammad. Every newborn is touched by Satan and begins life by crying, except for Mary and her son. Father Samir Khalil Samir is a Coptic Christian and a Jesuit. He's a doctor of Oriental theology and Islamology, and after over 40 years of experience in the Muslim world in Egypt and the Lebanon, he is currently Professor of Islamo-Christian Studies at the Oriental Pontifical Institute of Rome in Italy. Il n'y a que deux êtres au monde. According to Islam, there are only two beings who are not touched by Satan, namely, Jesus and Mary. There are countless stories about this hadith. It is said that when Satan wanted to touch the child and his mother from above, two angels immediately stretched out their wings over them to prevent him from reaching them. He tried from the side, and other angels stretched out their wings to protect them, and from below, and so on. All this belongs to the popular style that can be found in all the apocryphal scriptures, just like it can in the legendary Muslim narratives. But they have a very deep theological meaning. This meaning is that neither Mary nor Jesus was ever tainted by sin. In our religion, we talk about the absolute purity of Mary and Jesus, peace be upon him, total purity, and we believe that everyone else is touched by the devil. That's why I'm convinced that Mary and her son, the Messiah, peace be upon him, help me to approach God because of their purity and their teaching. From her earliest childhood, Mary's parents dedicate her to the temple where her Lord gives her a warm welcome. And it's Zachariah, the father of John the Baptist, who is given responsibility over the child. But Zachariah quickly realizes that he does not have to worry about her needs. Each time Zachariah came to see her in the temple, he found some food beside her. He asked her, where does this food come from? This comes from God Almighty. And so many miracles occur. We are told that she would find summer fruits in winter and winter fruits in summer. It's incredible. Everything is there. God reveals to us that this child is very special. 
tout spécial. So Mary leaves her family to go to a place in the east, far from her family. The angel Gabriel appears to her and announces that she will be the mother of an immaculate boy. How can I have a son when no man has touched me? I have never been unchaste. Thus says the Lord, we will render him a sign for the people and mercy from us. And this is what happened. Mary became pregnant and withdrew to a remote place. She is at the foot of a palm tree and feels anxious about the pains of childbirth. And a voice from beneath her says, Do not grieve. Your Lord has provided you with a stream. If you shake the trunk of this palm tree, it will drop ripe dates for you. Eat and drink and be happy. She was in the pains of childbirth, but God gave her a job to do. He said, get up and shake the palm tree, and she did so. And the tree gave her dates to eat, and God made a stream swell up that calmed her pain. So all this is a miracle, God's generosity, because she obeyed him and followed his ways. And the voice continued, When you see anyone, say, I have made a vow of silence. I am not talking today to anyone. This is how she gave birth to her son that God calls al Maser, Isa, son of Mary. God sent many prophets and messengers, from among whom he chose five, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace and God's salvation be upon them, and Noah, peace be upon him. These are the most important prophets. And so Jesus has a very important status for Muslims, and the Prophet, peace be upon him, never mentions Jesus without calling him his brother. So Jesus, peace be upon him, is the prophet of God, the servant of God, the word of God. He is the spirit of God sent to Mary. God made him a miracle in the eyes of the world. He is the one that God the Most High created without a father, just as he had created Adam, from nothing. This miraculous conception of Jesus aroused suspicion in Mary's family. When she returned to her family with the child in her arms, they accused her of having committed adultery. As she had taken a vow to God to remain silent, she made a sign for the newborn child to speak. Et Jésus parle. And Jesus speaks. This is Jesus' first miracle. As a baby, he speaks. This story also appears in the Apocryphal Gospels. But, as always, there is a theological meaning. How can a baby talk when he is the one who cannot talk? I am the slave of God. He has appointed me a prophet 
and has enjoined upon me prayer and almsgiving. That is, I have been sent to proclaim Islam, which means abandoning yourself to God and obeying God. So, everyone is amazed and understands that she has not committed adultery. So in the Quran, it is Jesus himself who defends his mother's reputation by speaking from the cradle. And he proclaims his mission at the same time. I am the servant of God. He has given me the book and he has made me a prophet. He made me blessed wherever I go and enjoined me prayer and almsgiving so long as I shall live and I'm to honour my mother. He did not make me a disobedient rebel. And the peace of God was on me the day I was born and will be the day I shall die and the day I shall be raised to life. And in many verses of the Quran, Jesus performs other miracles. He cures the sick, he heals lepers. And at one point, in one particular circumstance, he even performed a miracle by ordering a dead man to come back to life. And the dead man came back to life. Quand il était enfant, il forme de la terre. When he was a child, he made a kind of bird from some earth or clay. He breathed into it, and the bird came to life and flew away. Which, by the way, corresponds exactly to the creative act of God, which did two things, fashioning and modeling out of clay, and breathing the breath of life. Of course, these are only signs, miracles. But for Muslims, we know very well that it is not Jesus himself who heals, and it is not him who raises from the dead. But God gives him this power, as he gave the same power to Moses, so his rod would turn into a serpent. According to the Quran, these privileges that God gives to Jesus do not give him any sort of divinity. Jesus is a prophet like many others who went before him. The Muslim concept of power, this term power, is reserved for God. Nothing is made and nothing can happen without the power of God. To say that Mary received the breath of God, and therefore Jesus is God, this idea doesn't exist in Islam. In fact, the notion of signs or miracles, el mohajiza in Arabic, is something reserved for messengers or very special people mentioned in the Quran. This is so that anyone coming afterwards can't just say, I am such and such, I'm something, and here is my miracle. We don't believe in that. He can show us all the miracles he likes, but it doesn't interest us. 
Because, as Muslims, I say, we Muslims, in the Muslim view, we don't hold fast to miracles for themselves. This is something quite fundamental in Islam. In order to cut short anyone who comes afterwards saying, well, I'm this or that, so I must be something. No, the message stops with the messenger, and the revelation stops with the message given or revealed. Jesus, son of Mary. This is how the Quran most often refers to Jesus. In other places it calls him Spirit of God, Word of God, Messiah. But there are four categorical denials concerning Jesus in the Quran. He is not God, nor is he Son of God, nor the third person of a trinity, and he was not crucified. Another man who resembled him must have been crucified in his place. Of course, there are many theological debates on this resemblance. Who was it? Was it someone from his entourage or someone just passing by who bore a resemblance? But for us, Jesus was not killed, he wasn't crucified. He was taken up by God and of course we believe that he will come back one day. So he was not resurrected because he wasn't actually dead and he will come back again towards the end of time. In the Quran it is not said of anyone else, no other prophet, that God took them up. It's used only of Jesus in the Quran. So, maybe this is an allusion to the ascension? Jesus isn't dead? No. He's with God, and he will come back at the end of time. At the moment of the last judgment, he will proclaim then that, and this is not in the Quran, but in tradition, he will proclaim the end of the world and that Islam is the true religion. The story of Mary in the Quran stops after the birth of Jesus. One verse in Surah 23 adds only that God found a safe place for Mary and Jesus, a peaceful mountain with a spring. But the Quran does return several times to the virtues and privileges of Mary. Not only did God purify her and choose her from all the women in the world, but also she is the most excellent virgin, the virgin of faith, and of the fiat, the one who believed, because she believed in the words of her Lord. She and her son became a portent for the world. No other woman deserves this kind of praise. We Muslims see purity in Mary, an invitation to be pure, to avoid impure acts or incurring the anger of God as much as possible. This is our mission, be pure in order to follow our Lord in purity. Nala is married and has two children. She lives in Jerusalem, in the Holy Land, on the Mount of Olives. She works each day in the Old Town, 
in the Christian center, Ekehomo. She looks after pilgrims who come to the Holy Land. I believe Mary showed a great love for God because she obeyed him. Despite the fact that her mission was a difficult one, she obeyed him. She went through difficult moments, but God was always with her. She abandoned herself to him. This is what I see. As a Muslim woman, I have to make peace with everything God has made, and especially with other people. I believe that man is honored by God. He created all creatures. And among them he created man, so he honors man. So it's my duty to honor what God has created, man who is my brother, by my love for him, and without pride, because pride is not acceptable in our religion. To do this, I fix my eyes on Mary, and I see her humility. Her mission was so huge, and yet she was totally obedient to God, and so humble before Him, and she remained humble for her entire life. In what way can Mary be a bridge between our two religions? Mary is like a bridge. Firstly, because both Christian and Muslim scriptures speak about her in literally the same terms. In the passage about the Annunciation, both accounts are the same. When Mary says, I am the handmaiden of the Lord. May it be done to me as you say. Mary is a mediator because she doesn't claim to be anything herself. She brings other human beings together. This explains why a movement was started in Lebanon at Jamhur College. To celebrate Islam and Christianity coming closer together, the college decided to hold a great gathering on the 25th of March, the Feast of the Annunciation. In fact, it was following the initiative of two men, one a Maronite Christian, Naji Khoury, and the other a Muslim, Sheikh Mohammed Nokari, a former director of Dar el Fatwa, the highest Sunni Muslim religious authority in Lebanon, where since 25th of March 2007, Christians and Muslims have come together to pray on the Feast of the Annunciation. Since February 2010, this 25th of March has been declared a national Islamic Christian feast and a bank holiday by the Lebanese parliament for the whole country. This is a world first. What other country than ours, where the three monotheistic religions meet, could play such a role of bringing people together, of dialogue and openness? Is it too much to dream of a civilization of love, which can start from this blessed land to spread outwards towards the whole of humanity? So, let's dream, and our dream will become a reality. This began as an idea, and I've now been working on it for over 10 years, finding natural affinities and principles between Muslims and Christians in a non-superficial way that unite us in a common word. A word through which we affirm our faith in God, in his apostles, 
in his prophets, in his divine books, in which each of us believes in his own separate way, in the last day, and in the importance of charitable work. One of the practical fruits of this collaboration is the planned building of a Marian Islamic Christian Centre in the square near the National Museum in Beirut. It will be renamed Mary Square. This place is symbolic because it is here that the Green Line used to pass through, which divided the east from the west of the town and separated Christians from Muslims. This feast day that has been introduced in Lebanon means that the essential attitude of a believer is to be able to say, Here I am, Lord. I come to do your will. If we, as believers, Muslims, Christians, Jews, or whatever, Learn to say in our daily lives, Here I am, Lord. You can ask of me whatever you wish. I am yours. Then God will save me and give me the strength to do the impossible, the unbelievable. This is what I believe is our message to us who believe, together, whatever our faith is. This month, we can pray for peace in relations between Christians and Muslims throughout the world. May the initiative of Rapprochement and Dialogue that has begun in Lebanon spread throughout all our countries. The word of the month is in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, Verse 38, Mary said, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it happen to me as you have said. <laughs>